Bokeh Tov, Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. It is January 27th, 2017, and of course, it is National Holocaust Memorial Day, according to the United Nations in 2005, uh, that set this day aside as a remembrance day for the Holocaust victims around the world. This morning, I listened to an 88-year-old man's testimony uh, that was a survivor of Auschwitz that spoke about uh, his, at 16 years old, when he entered into Auschwitz death camp, uh, coming from Germany through Czechoslovakia, uh, through Prague here, and onward to, to Auschwitz, and how that, uh, speaking about the hardship of breaking away from his mother at 16, he said it was the first time in his life he'd ever been separated from his mother and his father. Of course, he was separated at the camp as well as his um, father from his mother, and he said he didn't know at the time, but later learned that uh, when his mother went to the left and he went to the right, that where she was going, he said they, they, that she was going to the gas chamber. But what was so provocative about his testimony was how that he spoke about the Germans were so polite at that moment when they first entered into the camp, uh, and they were kind, saying nice things. If you're not able, if you feel like you're not fit for work, then please go this way. Very delusional. He said you could smell the, the, the charred flesh, the burns from the, uh, after the gas chambers going into the ovens. He said the stench of death was everywhere. He said later though, he said we learned that it, my mother went straight to her death. Very, very troubling indeed. Um, also today we found out that Germany, uh, this came out uh, as of uh, early this morning uh, here, the German government is funding a radical anti-Israel group according to a report that's been revealed to Arut Shiva, Israel, Nationals New, Israel National News. Germany dishonoring the memory of, of six million murdered Jews. I can really understand what they're talking about, especially from my mother's family, that also many of them were killed in the Holocaust. Uh, descendants of her family are, are uh, luckily on my mother's side, her father came, or their, his grandfathers, they came illegally to the United States avoiding the Holocaust, but many of the family members, of course, died in the Holocaust. My father's also, uh, he had, they, his family had came early into the United States, and unfortunately most of the Danun family have no idea that they are Jews, but uh, they, they are very much, they are from the Benun family. And, uh, and of course, I have cousins here, even in Prague, that have shared with us the thousands of our family members that were killed in the Holocaust as well, distant cousins on my father's side, that is. But anyway, going on, the government of Germany is providing financial backing to a radical anti-Israel non-government organization working to promote the view that the establishment of the Jewish state was a disaster. And what we're finding out right now, there is a major campaign undergoing right now uh, across Europe and around the world. Uh, they have been hiring in writers to, to discredit the Jewish people and their right to the land, especially since President Trump has taken a stand with the Jewish state and trying to reaffirm uh, America's commitment to, to a Jewish homeland. Now others are going against him and really pushing hard to delegitimize the Jewish people's right to the homeland. And we do take this pretty very serious and very personal here at Israeli News Live. Uh, not that we are against the Palestinian people, the Arabic peoples that are living in the land and that were born there, etc. We believe in equality for these people, as does uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has stated that publicly before and other Jewish uh, people as well. But what we're doing is we're going back to the promise that was made uh, by the first by the British mandate after the 1917 war against uh, the Ottoman Empire, where the British toppled uh, the Ottoman Empire with the help of some of the Arabic peoples that were living in this land. In doing so, then the British mandate had mandated in 1920 a Jewish homeland. And doing so, they were giving everything that is considered modern-day Israel now west of the Jordan River, including what is called the West Bank today and Gaza, and as well, everything to the east of the Jordan in what is called the modern-day country of Jordan. But two years later, in 1922, that was changed, and that was taken away from a Jewish homeland, and the British government give this over to Hussein 
uh, excuse me, uh, Hussein's son, Abdallah, as a reward for helping them to fight in this battle. Keep in mind, too, though, at this time, everything then west of the Jordan now was being re-promised as a Jewish homeland. No West Bank, no Gaza. In fact, a very small minority of Arabic peoples living in this land. And it was not part of the mandate to push the Arabs that were living here out of the land. But what happened after that, though, became very strange. Now, there, of course, there were already Jewish people living in amongst the Arab neighbors as well during this time. And they were living in peace even before the collapse of the Ottoman Empire when uh, Jews from Iran and other parts of the Middle East had migrated to the, to the land here and were buying up large tracts from the Arabic neighbors here that were willing to sell this part of the land off in order for them to gain extra money and for the Jewish people to have their own homeland once again. But this all changed come 1947 with a new resolution that not only was taking away the land that was promised to the Jews in 1920 and in 1922, but now they were going to carve that up and give it to a group called, at this time, Pal well, they weren't called Palestinians at that time. They later were given this name, but to the Arabic people that had been allowed six years on a continual basis during World War II to migrate to this land illegally and also stopping full immigration of any Jews from Europe during World War II while Hitler was bent on annihilating as many Jews as possible. Now, I have also read too that Hitler at that time before the war was willing to send the Jews to Palestine or to Israel, modern day Israel, for them to go to their homeland. But there was someone in the Vatican that didn't want that happening and they made sure they stayed there while they begin to put a call to the Jewish people. Unfortunately, I'm very sad to know that this is so, but now we're seeing all of this anti-Zionism propaganda. And I'm not for the Rothschild Zionist view either, but I do believe that the Jewish people do have a right to return to their homeland and not to, not to annex land from those Arabic peoples that are living in the land, but it should be one state in a state where there is equality for both, unlike the UN Resolution 181 in 1947 that recarved out the land once again and was giving it more of an apartheid two-state solution as what they did in 1947, saying there would be no Jews living in Palestinian West Bank and there would be no Arabs living in the Jewish state. Well, for one, Jews have never been like that. They have always been used to inter living among other peoples and have done so willingly and without any issues, which is a good example of this, again, is when we see in this article here that just came out on United with Israel that the Israelis are taking in 100 orphan children from the Syrian conflict and will be giving them full Israeli citizenship within four years. They will come in, they will house them, care for them, these are children that, were, that are without families. And to show you the, the consideration that the Israeli government gives to these children, they're not just going to go put them in foster families of Jews. They're putting them in Arabic foster families where they can be raised according to customs that they are acquainted with. This is inclusion. This is the way Israel should be. And I don't say that the Israeli government is perfect or everything goes always smoothly and rightly and that there's always perfect equality for the Palestinian people in the West Bank or the people inside of Gaza. I realize there are problems, but at the same time, there are outside entities that are constantly inciting the Palestinians as well as the, the, the Arabic people living in Gaza against the Jewish people, and it is a minority. We know this. We've interviewed Israelis. We've talked to Palestinians as well and intend on in interviewing Palestinians in the very near future to bring this more, in, more of this information out to the public that they can see it is a minority, and not to mention the majority of Palestinian women would never want a Palestinian state under the idea of a Sharia law state, which is what most of it would be. If it was more like Syria, it would be a lot better. But then again, it would also subject all the Israelis that are living in Judea and Samaria to a second set of laws, which would never work. So moving on to other news here. Um, the Palestinian Authority, by the way, too, they did get the $221 million payout that uh, President Barack Obama secretly signed away before leaving his administration. We know that President Trump did try to put a freeze on this, but it did not work. Uh, the, the funds did arrive without any issues. 
Uh, now, whether or not that will end up going for the people's benefits and helping in the rebuilding in Gaza, for example, or to help in uh, the, the cost of uh, the, the, the suffering that is going on with the, with the Arabs that are living inside of the West Bank is yet still to be seen. If it's according to the history, no, it never does. In Gaza, it goes to building more uh, terror tunnels, and in the West Bank, it normally goes to the those that are in power and their families to live lavish lifestyles instead. Uh, moving on into other news as well, uh, President Trump, as we know, did sign the Dakota pipeline to get this moving, to get the EPA looking back into uh, what was going on, uh, you know, to get this pipeline going. I realize and I appreciate the fact that President Trump is trying his best to stimulate the economy and get rid of the $17 trillion debt. Uh, that Obama has left behind for him, and he's looking for some creative ways to do so. But I think his haste in doing this, uh, I know some have said he's going to reroute the pipeline. If he does that, then I'm all for that. I appreciate that, and I realize that it would help. But unfortunately, according to the, to the, to the Sioux Nation, uh, part of the indigenous people that are living there in the Dakotas there is the Sioux tribe, which I have a good friend of mine that is actually a... a uh, that, is actually a Sioux, uh, Sioux Nation member as well. Uh, but this is something that the people, the Sioux Nation does not want. And they are protesting once again by the thousands. So un undoubtedly, President Trump's decision to sign this was not in their interest. Let me just play just a short clip for you here uh, of, uh, this is David, uh, Unc Unc uh, excuse me, uh, David Archambault II and what he has to say about this I'd like to just play just a couple of, a few seconds here for you so you can see uh, his opinion on this particular signing by President Trump. I have executive order, but as uh, you stated and others, we were prepared for this, so the question is what next? We were prepared, prepared for uh, President Trump to take a run at everything that we had accomplished over the past two years. We had uh, asked for an environmental impact statement because we have concerns. and. and the troubling thing is that uh, this, this president is um, circumventing federal law. We, don't, we have treaty rights, we have water rights uh, with our winter, winter's doctrine, we have NEPA, and uh, the Environmental Protection Agency was put in place for a reason. It was because corporate world was contaminating water, the corporate world was contaminating our air, corporate world was contaminating our lands. So for this president to come in and say we're going to streamline everything and forget the Environmental Protection Agency proposal. I have to stand with David Ocker bolt on this as well. Uh, you know, and especially because the fact that the, the Native Americans have really been dealt a very harsh hand by our the ancestors that we have as Americans, me being an American as well. And uh, they have really been treated very ill by our forefathers that came in uh, for, for hundreds of years now. And now they're living on small reservations. And even that comes under the scrutiny of whatever uh, executive order that can be signed, whether it be by President Obama or any other president in the past, as well as President Trump. And to me, they should have the right to their property, period. Uh, they have very little to begin with, and much like the Jewish people want to return to their native homeland, then the Native Americans, uh, the indigenous people of the land, whether it be the Sioux, or the Apache, the, the Seminole, or, or the Creek Indians, or uh, you know whatever it may be around this country, there's many other tribes as well, they should have a right to their own nation uh, within the United States. And I, I think that's the only fair thing that can be done. I don't think it'll ever happen, but nonetheless, when it comes to just building something and signing an executive order to go right through someone's land like that, uh, as much as it's been done wrong to them already, that should not be permitted whatsoever. And in fact, if President Trump really wants to uh, help stimulate the economy, rerouting the pipeline, though it may cost billions of dollars more, millions or whatever the case may be, it's only more jobs uh, for those that would be working in it to begin with, because to reroute it means more pipes to be built, more manpower, et cetera. So, and maybe he is thinking of doing that, I do not know, but it, it is concerning for me as well for the indigenous people of the United States. Another breaking news story as well, not only is the fact that we're looking at the fact that uh, uh, Ukraine is heavily fighting to try to take back uh, the 
eastern part of Ukraine from the self-proclaimed uh, Donetsk People's Republics and Luhansk People's Republic there. Uh, they have been firing more and more heavy fighting, started again late last night, uh, and has gone on uh, grad launchers, tanks, everything, another push to take back the land, but as well, Poroshenko fears uh, possible impeachment from what one uh, journalist has written. Very interesting. He says, uh, Poroshenko fears impeachment, negotiates with Russia and the U.S. for security guarantees. It says, in a recent weeks, the representative Petro Poroshenko arrived in Moscow and the USA for negotiations about provisions of guarantees for security. This can be confirmed that Poroshenko is afraid of being dismissed from power and prepares an extra airfield for himself. Um, very interesting article there. It's on uh, stalkerzone.org is the one that wrote about this. There was a, um, uh, a Russian writer, Zakhar uh, Prilipin, who also has uh, confirmed this information uh, that Poroshenko is no doubt worried that he is about to be replaced. And I can certainly see how that could be. Uh, also, President Putin and President Donald Trump are going to speak tomorrow on Saturday, January the 28th, for the first time in a telephone conference there. I am really curious to see how that's going to go because I'm concerned tremendously over the European theater right now. President Trump has not backed down on allowing all this uh, equipment and military supplies that are coming in. It is still on the rise. Even the Canadians by June this year will be sending, uh, sending a NATO contingency of a thousand troops, uh, and I believe that's to lift uh, uh, Luhansk, excuse me, I'm sorry, not Luhansk, but they'll be going to uh, Latvia uh, by June of this year. Uh, we've had the, uh, the many other nations in Europe that have already been contributing more and more troops. The tanks, the, the more equipment continues to pour in all along the Baltics now. They're, re they're, they're really beginning to beef up the Baltics. We have U.S. forces inside Ukraine training battalions there. Uh, it seems to be no back down whatsoever and only more provocation uh, by NATO uh, of course, with Barack Obama, who was really leading the way on this. Let's see if this is going to back down. And, of course, as we reported, that uh, Kaliningrad, which is a Russian province inside of uh, Europe there, inside of Northeast Europe, is very much become Europe's own Cuban crisis, the Cuban Missile Crisis, much as what we had under President John F. Kennedy back in the 60s. And now Europe is faced with the same situation. But Europe has no one else to blame but the Obama administration as well uh, with their push to build up forces on uh, the borders of Russia there in Lat Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia because Russia was only responding as they promised they would respond uh, for the buildup of troops there. And so they put nuclear-capable ICBMs that are capable of striking uh, pretty much anywhere in Europe, including the UK, uh, including Germany and France. Uh, so it has become very much another Cuban crisis. And the only way I can see this is going to be resolved is if uh, the United States, uh, excuse me, if uh, President Trump does something about it to help defuse the tensions and for both sides to begin to withdraw their troops and arms that they have in the provocative positions around Europe and, of course, Russia as well. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom.